All right. So here tonight, we're, you know, of course, going through Numbers chapter number 35 here this evening. And what we're going to cover here tonight is the death penalty. Of course, that is uh, covered uh, somewhat there in this chapter here. And I don't think I've preached an entire sermon just on the death penalty before. But believe it or not, there is a lot of scripture about that in the Word of God. And so we're going to take a look at this here uh, this evening in depth. And let me just say this as we get started off here tonight. I do believe that, that these things that we're going to look at here tonight, the majority of the things in the Bible that God gives the death penalty for, that according to God and according to the moral laws of God, that those things are still in effect today. And let me just make it clear, it's not up to us to carry out the death penalty. We'll cover that here tonight in the Word of God. But it is the government's job that they are the instrument of God. It is their responsibility that that is what government is for, is to be a terror to evil and to promote good works. And so we're going to look at this here tonight. And of course, there are a few things in the Bible that God gave the death penalty for that are not in effect here today. Of course, one of those things was uh, when a stranger would come nigh into the tabernacle, he was to be put to death. And obviously that's not in effect today because we don't have this tabernacle today. And that was part of the old law, part of the law that was changed. Remember, the New Testament tells us that uh, because there was a change of the priesthood, then there was, there was of necessity a change of the law made also. Now most people today, you know, most people don't have a problem with murderers being put to death, do you? You don't have a problem probably with rapists being put to death or child molesters being put to death. I mean, I don't think anybody in here would have a problem with that. But how about adulterers? Because that was something that was in the Word of God, that adulterers were to be put to death. And we'll see that here this evening. And the only reason why you, would not have, why you do have a problem with that is because you have been brainwashed by the world. And you would say, well, Brother Joe, you think that's just as bad of a crime as the others? Well, obviously God did, since he gave the death penalty for it. And so we'll look at these things here tonight, and we're just going to look at what the Bible says about these things and about the death penalty. First of all, let's go back to verse number 15, just look at a few verses here. We already read all these, so we'll not take time to read the entire chapter again. But look back at verse number 15, the Bible says this right there, verse number 15. These six, these six cities shall be a refuge, but, but for the chil both for the children of Israel, and for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth any persons unawares may flee thither, and if he smite him with an instrument of iron, so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death, and if he smite him, with the throwing stone wherewith he may die, and he die, and he is a murderer, the murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smites him with a with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, and he, he is a murderer, the murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. He shall slay him, but if he thrust him of hatred, or hurl at him by laying wait, that he die, or an enmity smites him with his hand, that he die, he, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him, but if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without laying of wait, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he died, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm. The congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments, and the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge. So stop reading there. So the Bible already right here is making a clear difference. That there is a difference between killing somebody purposely, what we would call premeditated murder, when you, or, or slaying somebody with a weapon, when you pick up a weapon and you go after somebody, or when you just accidentally kill somebody. And accidents do happen in this world, unfortunately. You know, how many people, when they're driving down the road, get into accidents throughout the year and accidentally kill somebody 
and not purposely, they, they, they weren't being negligent or anything like that, but accidents do happen. So that's what the Bible's kind of covering there. That, hey, if a man kind of, if he throws a stone and doesn't see the guy that's there, he's not intending to throw that at him, and it hits him and kills him, well, that man is not a murderer. It's a tragic accident. Yes, and maybe you can make a case with a man being negligent, and in our day and time, we have laws to cover that, and that would be called what in our laws? Manslaughter, not murder in the first degree. So let's look at what the Bible has to say. In fact, go down to verse number 30 real quick. Go down to verse number 30. And the Bible also says this. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, but one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. So the Bible makes it clear. Because this is such a serious case. I mean, when you're going to put somebody to death, and you're going to give them the death penalty, that you need to be sure, and you need to, be, you need to know that that is the case, that that person is actually a murderer, and so it can't be just by the mouth of one person. Because then you have one person accusing one person, it's one person's word against the other, but it must be by multiple witnesses. And in our day and time, it ought to be the same type of thing. That if we're going to put somebody to death, it ought to be by the mouth of multiple witnesses. And in our day and time, you know, we have such a technology today that we can, we can get uh, all kinds of evidence, evidence today with DNA and all that kind of stuff. And so if you're going to put somebody to death, first of all, let me just say this. You must be sure that they are guilty. And so that's the first thing that the Bible is showing us there, is that if we're going to put someone to death, it must be, we must know that they are guilty. And by the way, the Bible also, we'll see later on, gives a, a, a penalty for those who would falsely accuse someone. And if somebody falsely accused someone, whatever the penalty was for, for what they were accusing that person of, that was the penalty that was to be laid upon them. So if you were accusing somebody of being a thief, then the penalty would be the penalty of a thief that was laid upon you. Or if you were accusing someone of being a murderer, then the penalty, if it was found out that you were a false accuser, would be that you then were given the death penalty because you were trying to commit premeditated murder. In essence, because you're falsely accusing this other person, you're trying to get give them the death penalty, you're trying to kill them, and so the penalty upon you would then be the death penalty. And by the way, I believe that ought to be the same in our day and time today. That in our laws, we should have those same exact laws. That if you falsely accuse somebody, whatever the penalty is for that uh, accusation, it ought to be laid upon you if you are a false accuser. Now let's look at some scriptures. In fact, let me just give you a list here quickly as we get going here tonight. A list of things. You can go to Genesis chapter number 6. Go ahead and turn over there. Go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter number 6 and we'll start there here this evening. But uh, as you're turning there, I'm going to give you just a list. We don't have time to go through every single one of these scriptures here tonight. And so I'm just going to give you a list, a general list of things that in the Bible that God gives the death penalty for. And so I'm just going to give you that list here quickly. And if you need to write those things down or if you need to get, look at those things later, of course, you can look it up on YouTube and, and find that. But uh, first of all, a man that would smite a man. So a murderer, of course, we see that here in, in Numbers. But then also you see that in Exodus chapter number 21, verse number 12. Secondly, he that smites mother or father. So a young man that would hit or smite his father or his mother, of course, out of anger, the penalty for that would be death. In the Bible, that's given in Exodus 21, verse number 15. Uh, the next one, Exodus 21, verse number 16, he that would steal a man. Because there are those out there in the world that try to teach that the Bible condones slavery. I mean, just going to steal people and making them your slave. And the Bible doesn't condone that. In fact, the penalty for that, for someone that would steal a man, was death, is what the Bible says. That's Exodus 21, verse 16. Exodus 21, verse number 17. He that would curse his father or his mother would be put to death. Now, what does it mean by cursing his father or his mother? 
Is that what we think of today when we say when we say that somebody's using curse words? No, no well, something that curses somebody in the Bible would be somebody actually placing a curse upon them. Or telling them, hey, go to hell. Wouldn't that be putting a curse upon somebody? I mean, if I looked at Brother Patrick and I told him, hey, Brother Patrick, go to hell. That would be a curse. Okay, so that's what placing a curse upon somebody. Or trying to put that upon somebody that the death penalty it was given for that. And of course, that is found in Exodus chapter number 21, verse number 17. Those who would curse their father or mother. The next one is Exodus 21, verse number 29. So, so far you see a lot of these are in Exodus 21, don't you? Exodus 21, verse number 29. An owner of a beast that has been known to push and he fails to keep him in. So what that means is a beast that has been known to push a dangerous animal that's been known to go after people. That if the owner does not keep that, that animal pen in and make sure that he stays away from people and doesn't harm anybody, that if that beast got out and killed somebody, then the owner would be put to death for that. That's in Exodus 21, verse 29. The next one, Exodus 22, verse number 19, whosoever lies with a beast. And I don't think you need me to expand too much on that, but somebody who would have relations with an animal they would be put to death. Uh, Exodus chapter number 31, verse number 14. He that defiled the Sabbath day would be put to death. Now obviously, that is one that we no longer put people to death for today, do we? Because we don't keep the Sabbath day in the New Testament because that has been fulfilled in Christ. And I preached on that in the past. I'll well, not re preach that sermon here tonight. But the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that if we're going to enter into that rest, that we must cease from our own works. And the Sabbath is kept in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our rest is in Him. And the Sabbath was a picture of that. By the way, it was a good picture of salvation. Because what did the Sabbath show you? That you had to cease from your works in order to be saved. And if you didn't cease from your works, then you were put to death. Now that's a good picture of salvation, isn't it? Because if you don't cease from your works and you continue believing in your works, now you might not be put to death in this life, but where are you going to be put to death? In death and hell, the second death is what the Bible shows us. So that was in uh, Exodus chapter 31, verse 14. Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 2. They that gave of their seed to Moloch. So those that would take their children and they would cast them into the fire on the altar as a sacrifice to the false god Moloch. That if anyone did that, they were given the death penalty. Okay, the next one was uh, Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 10. He that commits adultery... With another man's wife, and the Bible says, the adulterer, meaning the man, and the adulteress would be put to death, the Bible says. And I believe it says that their blood would be upon their own hands. And the next one is Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 12. A man that lies with daughter-in-law, the Bible says, both of them would be put to death. Obviously, these are people who are being... And, you know, they're consensual with one another, and they're doing these things behind closed doors, and, and the Bible says that they're, if they're found out, then they'll be put to death. Now, obviously, if a man forces a woman to do something, the woman was not to be put to death. And the Bible covers that, that if a man were to rape a woman, the man was to be put to death. But the Bible says that the woman has committed nothing worthy of death, that she is innocent. The next one the Bible covers in, uh, in Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 13. If a man lie with mankind as he has with womankind, the Bible gives a death penalty for that. The next one, of course, Leviticus 20, 15, we already saw it. If a man lie with the beast, the, the Bible says the man and the beast would both be killed. Uh, Leviticus chapter number 16 as well says, if a woman lie with the beast, the Bible says the woman and the beast would both be killed. The next one is Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 27. If a man that has a familiar spirit or a wizard, so someone who is dealing with, with demons and devils, they have a familiar spirit, they were to be put to death in the land. The next one was Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 20. If a man 
were, were to lie with his uncle's wife, he was to be put to death. The next one, Leviticus chapter number 24, verse number 16. He that blasphemed the name of God, they were put to death. The next one, Numbers chapter number 1, verse number 51. The stranger that came nigh to the tabernacle were put to death. Obviously, that's not in effect any longer here today. The next one, the prophet or the dreamer of dreams that were turned the people away from God it was, were put to death. That's Deuteronomy chapter number 13, verse number 5. The next one was uh, was he that raped a betrothed damsel, Deuteronomy 22, verse number 25. They were put to death. And the last two here, Deuteronomy chapter number 17, and verse number 12, says and that a man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth the minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die. So when the judges had already passed sentence, they've already passed their judgment, and that man wouldn't hearken unto them, he's being presumptuous and sinning against that, just defying the judges, he was to be put to death. The last one, Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 20, the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. So take notice of this, especially if you're going to be a preacher. I mean, listen up, this ought to be a warning to you. And the Bible says there, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So false prophets were given the death penalty. So when, uh, when Elijah later on in the land of Israel, and he kills 400 prophets of Baal and kills them all, was Elijah, was he committing murder? I mean, 400 times? Or was he obeying the law of God? That was the law of God. And that's just a small list. I'm sure there are others that are in there. Just want to give you an idea of the multitude of the things in the Bible that the death penalty covers. Now let's look back where the Bible says. Go to Genesis chapter number 6. And first of all, what we want to see here tonight is why did God institute the death penalty first of all? Because in the beginning, when God first created the earth, and when he first placed man on the earth, there was no death penalty. And it wasn't until after the flood that God then instituted the death penalty on the earth. So look what the Bible says. Genesis chapter number 6, look at verse number 5. And the Bible says this right there. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Look down at verse number 11. The Bible says this, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? With violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So the reason why we're going to see in the Word of God that God instituted the death penalty was for what reason? Was because of the violence that had spread upon the face of the earth. Because there was no penalty, there was no death penalty. And so people just went on a bridge and they went into all this violence and they corrupted themselves upon the face of the earth. And that is what the death penalty is given to us to do, is to keep mankind from going into sin. And you may th sit there and think, well, the death penalty, that's not very loving. But in truth, the death penalty is very loving. Now, not to the person that you're putting to death, and it's not for them. They've had their chance, but they've gone against the Lord. They've gone against the Word of God. They could have had God's love given to them, but they chose to rebel against God. That's why the Bible says, therefore, their blood shall be upon their own heads. It was their own fault. If they wanted the love of God, if they wanted the grace of God, they could have had that had they chosen to obey God, but they chose to rebel against God. And so the love of God in the death penalty is not for those that you're putting to death. No, it's for everyone else that is out there in the world. Because if you allow the murderer to get away with murder, then what is that murderer going to do?
do next. Then he's going to go murder somebody else. If you are around that rapist to get away with rape, what is he going to do next? He's going to go out there and commit rape. Now, wouldn't you say that that's a problem in this world today? Yeah. Wouldn't you say that that's a problem in the United States of America? That we just take the rapists and we put them in jail for a few years and then they get out on bond and they go out there in the world and they commit rape again? Where was the love for that woman that was raped? Where was the love for the women that would be that man's victim down the road? You see, that those are the people that we ought to be loving and we love them by putting these kinds of people to death, that that is what the death penalty is given for. I mean, think about adultery. How is that loving that we put the adulterer to death? Well, because that protects families. That protects children. That protects women. That protects husbands. Because if the penalty for adultery was the death penalty, do you think there'd be a whole lot of adultery going on in this land here today? No, I mean, the few cases that you would have, would have, they'd be put to death and everybody would be scared to commit adultery. And then you wouldn't have the broken homes that you have in the United States today. You wouldn't have the children who are being raised by two mothers and two fathers and split homes all over the place. And so the love is not for the one who committed the crime. The love of punishing that person is for those who would later on be their victims because we allow them to continue on in their sin. Now look back at what the Bible has to say there. Genesis chapter number 6, look down at verse number 17. And the Bible says this right there in verse number 16. The Bible, or verse 17. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 17, the Bible says, let me get turned back over that, I flipped somewhere else. The Bible says in verse 17, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, essentially, what did God just do? He pronounced the death penalty upon everyone that was on the earth, of course, other than Noah and his family, because they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But everyone else, he's giving them the death penalty, isn't he? I mean, that's essentially what God is doing there. And isn't he just in doing that? Because the Bible tells us there that all flesh had corrupted themselves. That the entire earth was filled with violence. And so then we get to the other side of the flood in Genesis chapter number 9. And then God institutes the death penalty as a way to keep men from going into that type of violence. Again, look over at it. Genesis chapter number 9. Look at verse number 5. Turn over there and look what the Bible has to say there. Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 5. And the Bible says this in Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 5. And it says, And surely your, your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, uh, will I require it at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man, and you be ye fruitful, and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. So God's commandment to man is to do what? Is to go forth and to multiply on the face of the earth. He doesn't want mankind taking one another's lives in violence again. And so he institutes a death penalty as a means to protect people. And that's what God's law is given to us for. We have the law of God to give us life and to give us liberty. The Bible tells us that happiness is found in, in the law of God. Happy is he that keepeth the law. The Bible calls it the law of liberty because God's law gives us liberty. It gives us freedom. It gives us life. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter number 3 when it's quoting the Old Testament. It says, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Meaning that the law of God will give us life. And that's what the death penalty does. Now it may seem contrary to you, but by putting other people to death that deserve the death penalty, we are in essence preserving life is what we are doing. Because we're going to save those later on that would be murdered. We're going to save those that later on would be raped. 
We're going to save those that later on would be molested. We're going to save those later on that would have to suffer through the effects of a, of a split home. And so the law of God gives us liberty. And it was God's love that gave that to us because he did not want mankind descending into violence again. Look back what the Bible says. In fact, let's go ahead and cover some other things here tonight. Go to Exodus chapter number 21 and look at verse number 22. Because I want to cover this here tonight. Because many times, people will take this portion of Scripture and they'll twist it out of context. In fact, usually people that just want to use it for their own means because they'll make statements like this. Well, the Bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And what they mean is that they can exact revenge upon other people. That's usually how they use that. You know, so-and-so did this to me, and so I'm going to do this against them. An eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth. Well, is that what the Bible is telling us? Is the Bible telling us that we can just exact revenge ourselves? And I already told you, I gave you the preface before I even started here tonight, that it is not up to us to carry out the death penalty. It is not up to us to carry out revenge even against a murderer. That is given to the government. They have the responsibility of that. Look at what the Bible says here in Exodus chapter number 21. And look down at verse number 22. Exodus chapter number 21 and verse number 22. The Bible says this. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished. According as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any man, if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, strike for strike. If a man smite the right eye of his servant, or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. If he smite out his servant's tooth or his maid servant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. If an ox bore a man or a woman that they die, then he sh then the ox shall be surely stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner that he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. So let's stop reading there. So when the Bible says an eye for an eye, or a tooth for a tooth, what is it saying there? It's saying that the punishment should equal the crime. Not that you just get to go revenge and take revenge upon the person that has done you wrong. What the scripture is showing us by giving us all of these examples right there is showing us that the punishment should fit the crime. Now that is definitely something that in our law today we ought to follow, don't you think? In fact, I'd say it's a big problem in our country today that our country does not follow this. Because in our country today, we just allow people to commit uh, ch to child molest people and to commit rape and to do all these kinds of things. And we just lock them up for a few years and then they're let back out and they do the exact same thing. And why are they doing that? Because the punishment did not match the crime. I mean, if the punishment for a child molester was death and automatic, you know, automatic death, as soon as he was found guilty that he was to be put to death, you think there'd be a whole lot of child molesting going on? No. You think there'd be a whole lot of raping that was going on? But why do those things continue <clears throat> to escalate out of control in our country? And the reason is because the punishment does not match the crime. Let me show you some other scriptures on this same exact topic. Go ahead and go to Leviticus chapter number 24. And look at verse number 17. Leviticus chapter number 24. And look at verse number 17. When you get over there, Leviticus chapter number 24. And verse number 17, Leviticus chapter number 24, and verse number 17, the Bible says this, Leviticus 24, verse number 17, and the Bible says that he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death, and he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast, and if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so let it be done to him. Notice this, breach for breach, 
eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth the beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth the man, he shall be put to death. So the Bible's making it clear there. That why is it using this phrase? It's showing us that the punishment should meet the crime. If you kill a man, if you murder a man, then what's the punishment? Then the, 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 the be murdered. Then the death penalty is what is given for that. But if it's something that's lesser, if he cause a blemish in a man, well then what's the punishment for that according to the word of God? That the same blemish is given to you. If you have a tooth knocked out, then what is the punishment? Then your tooth knocked out. I mean, that is the punishment. It's just making the point in the word of God that the punishment should meet the crime. No more and no less. Look back where the Bible says. Let's go to one, one other place on this. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Look what the Word of God has to say. Deuteronomy chapter number 19. And look at verse number 16 over there. Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Verse number 16. Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Verse number 16. I tell you what, after we get through all this, we're getting close to being finished with the book of Numbers. Y'all ought to be experts on the law of God by the time we get through this. We've spent so much time on it. Maybe after Numbers we can get on to something else. So we look at number, uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 19 and look at verse number 16. The Bible says this. In verse number 16, the Bible says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be false, and be a false witness, and have testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother." So shalt thou put, uh, put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and do what? And fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you, and thy eye shall not pity, the Bible says, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So what is the Bible saying here? Is it saying that you just get to go indiscriminately and uh, just commit revenge upon that person that had wronged you? No. no, the Bible is teaching here actually that these people are to be delivered unto the judges. And that they are to make diligent inquisition to try to figure out whose story is the right story. And when it is found out that one has falsely accused his brother, whatever it was that he had thought to do unto him... That punishment was to be put on him. If the punishment was life for life, if he was accusing his brother of committing murder, then he would be put to death. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not have pity on him, the Bible says. And it says that life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Whatever the punishment was, what is it showing us there once again? That the punishment should equal the crime. If a man was accusing his brother of being a thief, well then the punishment then would be whatever the punishment was for a thief. If the punishment was adultery, well then the punishment would be adultery. If, that was, if that's what he was accusing him of, whatever it was, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, the punishment equals the crime. Now we have this same principle taught to us in the New Testament. Did y'all know that? Let's go ahead and look at it. Go to, Leviticus, go to Revelation chapter number 13. Look at verse number 10. Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 10. You should have caught this on Sunday, right? We're looking at Revelation chapter number 13. Probably didn't think about this too much. Look at Revelation chapter number 13. And look down at verse number 10. It's taught other, other places in the New Testament as well. But this is just one good example of it. Look, Revelation chapter number 13. And verse number 10, the Bible says this, Revelation 13, verse number 10, says this, He that leadeth into captivity <coughs> shall do what? Go to captivity. So the punishment for leading others into captivity is what? Captivity. captivity. It says, He that killeth with the sword must be what? <laughs> must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Of course, this is in context 
talking about the end times and talking about the Antichrist because the saints are going to be led into captivity. They're going to be killed with the sword. The Antichrist is making war against them, but God is giving the point here that, hey, here's the patience of the saints. That we are to be patient and not take revenge for ourselves because the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And that we should be patient. And he that leads into captivity, he's going to go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword, he's going to kill, be killed with the sword. That God himself is going to make sure that that punishment is brought upon them. And the Antichrist, what is going to happen to him? Because the Antichrist is the one who's, who's putting this all out there in the world. Well, the Antichrist is going to go into captivity, isn't he? Yeah. Where's he going? Yeah. He's going down to hell. The Antichrist is going to be killed. Where is he going? Well, he's going to be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. The punishment is equal the crime. Now, let's look at what Jesus had to say about this. Go to Matthew chapter number 5 and look at verse number 38. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 38. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 38. Because I want to make this extremely clear here tonight. Because people, when you preach this kind of message, inevitably some goofball out there on YouTube is probably going to listen to it and they're going to accuse me. And you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, well, Joe Major, that pastor over there at Faith Baptist Church, he's just trying to stir things up and he's trying to get his people to go around and to take revenge. Now we're just supposed to go around and we're supposed to kill all these people. We're just supposed to go kill the adulterers. We're just supposed to go round them up. We're supposed to do all this ourselves. Now, have I said that here tonight? No. No, I've told you what the punishment is, and what else have I told you? You don't take revenge yourself. The punishment meets the crime, and it's the government's job to administer that punishment. Look what the Bible says here. Matthew chapter number 5. Look at verse number 38. Matthew chapter number 5. Verse number 38, the Bible says this, Ye have heard that it hath been said, notice this, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if a man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, Go with him twain, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So what was Jesus teaching us there? Was he teaching us that we can just take eye for eye and tooth for tooth ourselves? No, because that's the government's job. It's not our job. And so if somebody smites us on the cheek, what did Jesus say? Turn the other cheek. If they compel you to go with them for a mile, go with them twain. Go with them two miles. If they take away your cloak, give them your coat also. That it's not our job to revenge ourselves. God is the one who, who will revenge us later on. And so this scripture should make it abundantly clear that we are not to be taking vengeance ourselves. When we're taking a, a talking about the death penalty here tonight... It is not for us to administer the death penalty. And by the way, not just the death penalty, but it's not for us to administer the law. Now, yeah, sure, within the church, there are things that the Bible does teach, and we'll get on this some other time, that the Bible teaches that there are things within the church that we should judge within the church. That if two brothers have caused against each other in a financial matter where one has defrauded the other, that that should be judged within the church, that should be dealt with, but we're not dealing with murderers. We're not dealing with child molesters. We're not dealing with rapists. If we ever find out that somebody in the church is a murderer, you know what I'm going to do with them? I'm going to deliver them to the judges. Not for us to judge. It's for them to judge. If anybody ever comes in here and commits and, and, and you know, we find out they're a child molester, guess who they're going to be delivered unto? The judges, if we find out somebody's a rapist, they're going to be delivered unto the judges. Look back with the Bible. So let's, let's look at some other things. Let's move on here tonight. In fact, let's go ahead and take our Bibles. Let's go to Romans chapter number 1. Because I already gave you quickly here tonight what the Bible says about the death penalty and those things that the Bible gives the death penalty for. And I told you the majority of those in the eyes of God are still in effect. That they should be carried out 
by the government still here today. Now, yes, there are some that are not in effect. We don't put people to death for not keeping the Sabbath day because that has been done away with. We don't put people to death for, uh, for coming near the tabernacle because the tabernacle does not exist here today. That's been done away with. That was part of the Old Testament law that was done away. But according to the moral law of God, the moral law of God was never done away. Can anybody show me one scripture in the Bible here tonight where God says not to put people to death for those things? One? One scripture. You know, you can't find one there in the Word of God. It's not there. And so if God says something in the Old Testament and He never changes it, never gives a commandment and says, hey, you're not to do this anymore, well then should we assume that it's done away with or that it's still in effect? then it's still in effect according to the Word of God. Because God said in the book of Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not, the Bible says. But where did I tell you to go? Go to Romans chapter number 1. Because we want to see what the New Testament says about this. Because inevitably, somebody that would try to refute this sermon here tonight, the, the, those things that I've said, they'd say, well, we're in the New Testament here tonight. And Jesus Christ gave, uh, gave us a different law, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, funny, you know what that's right after? Love thy neighbor as thyself. That the man lie with the man, thou shalt put him to death. Amen. Jesus wasn't giving a new law. He was quoting the Old Testament law. It was always taught in the Bible, always taught in the Old Testament, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now go to Romans chapter number 1, and let's look at verse number 18, see what the Word of God has to say there. Romans chapter number 1, and verse number 18. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 18. And the Bible says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may, which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and, to, and four footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is, which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. Now, what kind of people are we talking about here? We're talking about sodomites. We're talking about homosexuals. That these kind of people, these are what we talk, we are talking about. And notice that at the end of verse number 27, what does it say? And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. What does it mean, the recompense? What's that talking about? It's talking about the reward is what it's talking about, that they're going to be rewarded for their evil deeds, that there is consequences to living that kind of a life. And what would be the consequences of being a sodomite in living that kind of a lifestyle? Death. death. Not just the death penalty, but let's say before the death penalty, before that's even found out maybe that you're a sodomite, what is the consequences that could take place in their life? Well, did you know that the median average age for somebody that lives that kind of a lifestyle is 50 years old? I mean, their life is going to be short. And by the way, the average sodomite out there today, you can look up the statistics yourself, they've had over 500 different partners. People that they have committed these abominations with. I mean, could you imagine 500 different people? I mean, some of them in the thousands of people. And so they contract all these diseases out there. That is the recompense of their error. You live this kind of a life. You get, go against the law of God. And your life 
will be shortened. Look back what the Bible says. Let's continue reading. Verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, polygamy, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are what? Worthy of that. Funny little three words there, huh? That those that commit those kind of sins according to the New Testament are worthy of what? Death. Worthy of death, the Bible says. So, so far, those things that I've showed you in the past, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, well, the Bible's confirming those things. Not only does it not just not say anything about it, it actually confirms that. That those things that were done in the Old Testament, you do these things. And specifically, it's talking about the queers here. It's talking about sodomites. That they which do such things are worthy of death. You want a clearer scripture? Let me give it to you. Go to 1 Timothy. Go ahead and turn over there. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And see what the Bible has to say there. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And let's see what the Word of God has to say there. It's funny, this just lines up with people out there in the world that desire to be teachers of the law. And it's just it, it's extremely clear that they desire to be teachers of the law, but they understand not what they speak. They want to talk about the laws of God, and yet they don't understand the laws of God. And it's amazing, those people who are queer, they understand it. I mean, the Bible says they know the judgment of God. I mean, they know it, yet they do it. I mean, I remember one week I was out soul and knocked on the door, gave the lady a track, invited her to church, and then I asked her the question that I always ask everyone. Hey, do you know that you're going to heaven? You know what the lady told me herself? She said, no, I'm going to go to hell because I'm a queer. Wasn't it Jason, weren't you with me? Yes, I, I believe it was Jason that was with me when we were out soul. She knew the judgment of God. I mean, she said it herself. I didn't say it. That came out of her own mouth that she said that. And these queers know that. And these homosexuals, these sodomites know that. But it's amazing, Baptists today don't know it. And why is that? Because they've been led astray by pastors out there. And led astray to believe that these things have just been done away with because we're in the New Testament. Well, let's look in the New Testament. By the way, this is later on in the New Testament. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And look at verse number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Look at verse number 2. And the Bible says this. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse number 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Then I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest change some... Charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Did you hear that? That you teach no other doctrine. Drive that into your mind. Now let's see what he's talking about. Look at verse number 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is what? Charity. charity. Hey, what's charity? Love. Hey, we're about to talk about the law here. Let's pay attention. And it says the end of the commandment is what? It's charity, the Bible says, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Notice these people that we're about to talk about, they have turned aside from this. They turned away from charity. They turned away from faith on faith. Hey, they claim to be teachers of the law. They claim to have love. They claim to have charity. They claim to have faith. But the Bible says, rather, they turned aside from it unto vain jangling, just, just uh, stupid speaking, basically. Look back where the Bible says here. The Bible says, verse number 7, desiring to be teachers of what? The law. The law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, the Bible says. So according to the word of God, is the law good or is the law evil? Good. Hey, is the law of God against the principles of God? No. The Bible says God forbid. 
I mean, the law has been given to us. It's something to protect us, to lead us, to guide us, to give us liberty and freedom and life in this world. But if you go against the law of God, then you will be judged by the law of God. If you go against the laws of men, are you going to be judged by the laws of man? Yeah. Absolutely, you sure will in this world. Look back at what the Bible says. Let's continue reading this. Let's get even more specific, shall we? Look at the book, verse number 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for what kind of a man? A righteous man. A righteous man. So, hey, if you're a righteous man, you don't have to worry about this, do you? If you're a righteous man, you don't have to worry about being put to death. If you're a righteous man and you don't commit adultery, you don't have to worry about it. If you're a righteous man, if you don't go into sodomy, then you don't have to worry about being put to death. If you're a righteous man and you don't steal, you don't have to worry about being punished for that. If you're a righteous man, because the law is not made for the righteous before the unrighteous. Look what the Bible says there. It says, uh, knowing that this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. And what did the Bible just say? It just affirmed everything I told you in the Old Testament. Then that list that I gave you before, hey, for adulterers, for fornicators, I mean, for men, stealers, I mean, everything. That the Bible just affirmed it. You want to read it again? Because that's pretty clear there tonight, isn't it? In fact, look back, look back at it. Let's emphasize this. Verse number 9 again. Look down at it. Verse number, or look down near the end of it. It says, for murders of who? Fathers. Fathers. Hey, didn't we cover that in the Old Testament? Yes. That the law is given for murderers, isn't it? For murderers of mothers, for manslayers. Now, what's the difference between a manslayer and a murderer? Anybody catch that earlier? A manslayer would be somebody that, you know, that's like manslaughter. You know, you accidentally kill somebody, but the law is still given for that. There can still be a punishment for that. It's just not the death penalty. Look back where the Bible said there. The Bible also said this, verse number 10, for who? For whoremongers. Hey, there's law for that. The Bible says, For them that defile themselves with mankind. What was the punishment in the Old Testament? Death penalty. The death penalty was given for that. And the Bible is saying here, But we know that the law is good if the law be used lawfully, the Scripture says. So it kind of sounds to me like the law is still supposed to be in effect, don't you think? That it is the government who still ought to be enforcing these things. Look back at what it says there. With mankind for men stealers. So hey, you steal somebody, you go kidnap someone, then the punishment still ought to be the same for that. What was the punishment for that? It was the death penalty, and it's still in effect in the New Testament. Look back at what the Bible says there. For liars, hey, that would be false excuses, wouldn't it? Hey, what was the punishment for that? Yeah. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, not just the death penalty. Right. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, hand for hand, foot for foot. You know, the punishment equal to the crime. Look back at what the Bible says there. The Bible says, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So according to the word of God, if you're going to be a teacher of the law, that understands the law and understands the things of God. Kind of sounds like to me you're supposed to still teach these things, aren't you? But yet it's not being taught in this world, is it? Yet you go into most churches today and you say, if you make the statement, like I said, that adulterers, according to the word of God, should be put to death, people look at you like, they're, like you're crazy. And am I crazy or is that what the Bible just said? No, the Bible just said it. That's in the New Testament that just said that. It affirmed everything that we just read in the Old Testament. Now, quickly, let's uh, let's go ahead and look in the Bible at who should carry out the death penalty. Go to Romans chapter number 13. Look back over there, Romans chapter number 13, and look at verse number 3. Romans chapter number 13 and verse number 3. Romans chapter number 13, verse number 3. By the way, I'll show you here in the Word of God. That because it is the government's job to, to put these kind of people to death and to carry out these laws, that this is their primary function. That this is why God has ordained governments. And if they go against this, they have lost their God-given right and ability to govern. 
if they go against the law of God, and that's why the Bible teaches us that we should rather obey God than man. Look at what the Bible says here. By the way, it is biblical to pay taxes. If your government is a righteous government, and they're obeying the laws of God, and they're carrying them out to a degree, not that they're a perfect government, but if they're carrying them out to a degree, it is biblical to pay your taxes for this reason, the Bible says. Look at it, Romans chapter number 13, and look down at verse number 3, the Bible says this. It says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power to do that which is good? And thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God. Who's the he? Who's the minister of God? The rulers that we just read about. Those who are in rule, the government is who that's talking about. For he is the minister of God to thee for what? Good. For good, but if thou do that which is evil, be what? Afraid. Afraid. Afraid of who? God. Afraid of the government. Hey, if you do evil, <clears throat> hey, you better be afraid because it's the government's job to come punish you. That's why it's saying that. And it says, for he beareth not what? The sword in make now the sword. Is that something you use just to just to lightly punish somebody? Or do you use the sword for killing someone? You use it for killing someone. And so the Bible is showing us there that the minister of God is the ruler and that he beareth not the sword in vain. That it is his job to do those things. It's the government's job to carry out the death penalty. Once again, I tell you, it's not our job. We're not to take vengeance for ourselves. We're not to revenge ourselves. But it is the government's job that we should deliver those who are, are accused of crimes unto the judges, unto the government, and they carry out the sword. They are not the sword in vain. Look back at what it says there. The Bible also says this right there in verse, what verse was that? Verse number, verse number four, for he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God. So again, it says it the second time there, doesn't it? For he is the minister of God, a what? Revenger. Revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subjects, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Notice this verse number 6. For, for this cause. What cause? Because he's the minister of God to you for good, but if you do evil... To bring evil upon you, he beareth not the sword in vain, because that is his job. The Bible says, for this cause, look at what it says, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So the reason that we ought to pay our taxes, to pay that tribute unto them, is so that they can continue to put to death those that are evil. So they can continue to bear the judgment upon those that would do evil. But if their government stops doing that, then they're no longer the minister of God, are they? Because they're made the minister of God for what purpose? To be a revenger. To bear not the sword in vain. That is the government's job. Look back where the Bible says. In fact, go to Romans chapter number 12 uh, very quickly, one chapter back. And look at verse number 19. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 12, verse number 19. The Bible says this. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt he calls a fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with Good. So according to the word of God, it's no coincidence that it says this in chapter number 12 at the very end, right before he's going to start talking about the ministers of God. Those that bear not the sword in vain. And right before that, what does he tell us? That we're not to bear vengeance. That we're to be good to our neighbor. That we're to overcome evil with good. So is the, is the death penalty biblical in the Bible? For all those things, sure it's biblical. But it's not our job to carry that out. That's the government's job to carry that out. And we should not revenge ourselves. Let's end in a word of prayer. We're out of time tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've shown us in your word tonight. I ask that you help us to take these things, to search them out, to study them, Father. We thank you for your word, how wonderful it is. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed tonight.
Good. Yes, sir.